welcome to the uh, 14th Elizabeth Chandra Lili Public Lecture Series. Today, it's our honor to have uh, Professor uh, Banerjee Kuha here. And may I introduce uh, Professor Banerjee Kuha to deliver the lecture. Thank you. I sincerely thank the organizers of this special lecture series. I think it is a, more than a pleasure, you know, to come to Hong Kong and address my colleagues here, my students here, whom I don't teach, and the Consul General of India has uh, made some time to come. That's great, I feel. So my colleagues here and my friends, I chose this topic for two reasons. First of all, Mumbai is trying to become Hong Kong. Mumbai is trying to become Shanghai. Mumbai is trying to become New York, which is quite disturbing for some of us. And secondly, it's a question of deciding about the future of the cities. And I'm coming to a place where I know researchers and urban issues have gone very strong. So I think I should not miss this opportunity to have the deliberations with my colleagues here and discuss with them how would they want the cities to grow, to reshape, and to tell them how we would like to see our cities grow, in what direction. As you know, India is a very populous country. So do we throw away the poor people? Do we hide them somewhere and make the cities beautiful? Or do we try to make some kind of policy which would bring them into the mainstream, which I think should be the public policy in many of these countries. These are the two reasons why I, why I decided to talk on the cities of India and the present urban policy. Neoliberalizing the urban. Neoliberalism is kind of a, the present strategy all the world over. But urban, neoliberalizing the urban, yes. We have felt that there is a need for us to talk about the cities and their relationship with neoliberalism. Because the cities have become very important centers. In India, they have become extremely important centers, and I know that in many other countries, they have become to further this kind of a capitalist regime which is now roaring across the world. And for that reason, I thought that we should have some kind of a you know, dialogue about neoliberalizing the urban. Since 1970s, you know, this studying urban has become a part of studying development. It's not just urbanization, it's not just studying the cities, but it's also studying the cities as a part of the development process. And therefore the pattern that the cities show do talk about how development has come on space. And this is another thing I would like to tell you, I don't know how many students of geography are here, that when we study the cities, we have a definite approach of space. That means we talk about the distribution of the cities, we talk about the distribution of wealth, we talk about the distribution of poor people, and we talk about the distribution of you know, various types of facilities. This 1970s is very important all the world over, because since 1970s, may not be in the global south, may not be in this part of the world, but since 1970s, urban also has become global in a very dramatic fashion. Because since 1970s, the nature of the production process has changed. 
there has been tremendous redistribution of the production process. There has been a tremendous disaggregation of the production process. And the production has got distributed all the world over. It, it has not come in one day, and it has not come in one region in one day. It is the process which started during 1970s. And since then, we have seen that all the world over, there has been a reshaping of global production centers, global production processes. Cities have become very, very important in that respect. There has been a new orientation of the urban functions. Sorry. Vis a vis the global and the national changes. And two, three processes have got very integrally associated with this. Number one is the financial deregulation. Number two is the revolution in communication and transport that has actually caused, rather enhanced, the redistribution of production or disaggregation of production activities. There has been an unprecedented labor migration, but here I would take it with a grain of salt. This unprecedented labor migration cannot match the mobility of capital. Mobility of capital, if some of you have really you know, worked on, 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 on Samir Amin or Arigiri Manuel, you know that there has been a tremendous mobility of capital which has really not matched with the mobility of labor because mobility of labor has been at the behest of capital. Who will move, who will not move, and who will really be stationed in their own areas where capital will come but the production system will come in whatever way, whether it is in an organized form or in an unorganized form, these are all decided. So there is, there is tremendous labor movement. In some regions of the world, there has been tremendous labor movement, but in some parts of the world, mainly in the underdeveloped parts of the world, the labor movement is not very, very matching with the movement of capital. And there has been another process which has, which has been found to be working during this time. And again, I'm telling, you know, it, 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 it got intensified in 1980s, further intensified in 1990s, as in India, it got intensified from 1990s. That is, the national and local states and the city governments responding to the above three processes, trying to appease capital, trying to discipline labor, and also trying to go backstage in terms of providing services, in terms of supporting a social reproduction. 